All right. So hello, everyone, both in person and virtually. Thank you guys for coming out, especially you guys in the rain coming to yeah. the library. I really appreciate it. My name is Jess. I'm a reference librarian here with the library. And uh, today we are going to be talking about houseplants for beginners. Um, we're going to be talking about a lot of different information today. So I do have a sign up sheet in the back there for um, you guys in person. If you want to write down your emails, I can send you the slides afterwards. Mm -hmm. And then for people who are virtual, if you want to put your email in the chat, then uh, Megan will take it down for you. To, so I can email that to you guys afterwards. Uh, so we can go ahead and get started. Okay, so today we are going to talk about all things houseplants. So first, we're just going to talk about some of the benefits of houseplants in general before we talk about all of their care aspects. So watering, lighting, environmental factors, repotting, propagation, and then dealing with pests. Then we'll talk about some good beginner houseplants and some recommended plants to get you guys started. All right, so getting started with houseplants can be very overwhelming and confusing, especially if you've never had them before. There's a lot of confusing and conflicting information out there, which can make it difficult to know what to do with your plants. So if you've ever Googled something like, why are my plants leaves yellow? You'll get like every reason under the sun. So, <laughs> you know, that it is overwatered, underwatered, needs to be repotted, uh, needs more humidity, like the list goes on. And the tough thing about plants is that all of those things could potentially be true. So hopefully the goal of this program is to give you a solid baseline of um, just how to take care of plants in general and help you give, get some ideas of how to troubleshoot whenever they're not doing as well as they, as they should be. So you've probably heard of things like green thumb and black thumb, and really a green thumb is just having that understanding of what your plants need and being able to give them those needs. Uh, so the goal is to increase your confidence a little bit, give you some ideas, and uh, keep in mind that you may and probably will still kill plants. It's definitely just part of the process and comes with it. And that's, that's totally okay. Okay, so to give you guys an idea of my interest in plants, my mom initially sparked my interest when I was young. She always had plants in the house when I was growing up. So I started getting into plants when I went off to college to kind of make my dorm room feel a little bit more homey and warm. And then my collection just pretty much grew from there. Um, so one of the reasons why I really love plants is because of the joy and the fulfillment they give me. It brings a lot of like life and warmth to the house. I'm constantly making my husband come look at new growth that he's seen a million different times. But it's like, it's doing it. It's growing. So it's always exciting for me and something that I really enjoy putting time and effort into. So benefits of having house plants. Uh, there are various benefits, um, including being able to sharpen your attention, reduce your anxiety and stress, increase happiness levels, and make you more productive. There are various studies that have been conducted on the benefits of house plants in this way. And additionally, it can just be therapeutic and have these mental health benefits that come along with it, because taking that time to slow down and care for something that is reliant on you can be really rewarding. But it's also not as serious as a pet or a kid or something like that. Like it's totally fine. And the process of checking in on your plants can be really just reduce the stress of your day to day life. So give you a second to pause and to kind of breathe. Um, there is a common myth that plants can meaningfully clean the air in our homes. And this stems from a NASA study from 1989 where they were trying to reduce formaldehyde and other VOCs in the air um, whenever they were out in space. But um, so while this was successful for their study, this isn't as applicable to our homes. There's just different environments. So things like people coming in and out, the circulation in our homes is different. So it's just, it's just a different situation. So basically you would need like an indoor forest of like 700 plants to meaningfully reduce your VOCs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, it would never end. <laughs> So while they aren't shown to clean the air in our homes yet, there's still those other benefits that plants can bring to you. All right, so our first topic is watering. So water is essential for all plants. If they don't have enough water, they will die, but also if they have too much, they will also die. It's just a fun part of plants. <laughs> uh, one of the most common causes of houseplant death is root rot. So this occurs when the roots are just sitting in that water and they aren't able to absorb all of it. We'll talk more about that and then how to avoid it. But in general, you shouldn't have a set rule for how often to water your plants. 
So even if you and your friend have the exact same plant, there are so many different factors that go into your own specific plants. So things like the light in your house, um, how old the plant is, what kind of planter it's in, all these different factors that make it really hard to say, oh, you should water this plant X times per week or something like that. So one of the better ways to kind of go about this is to set up a schedule for checking your plants. So have a routine where you go around and check in on your plant to see if they need to be watered rather than saying, oh, it's Tuesday, I have to go water this plant, that sort of a thing. And really that should be just because different plants plus the different conditions equals different watering needs. So that's the tough part when trying to figure out when your plants might need water. But in terms of when to water, you want to wait to water until the soil has pretty much dried out. This could mean once a week for some plants and then once a month for another. And you'll know when it's time to water by checking the soil. So the most reliable method is usually just to use your finger. And I usually stick mine in until like the second, the second knuckle. So just a couple of inches of above there. You can also use things like a soil probe or a moisture meter. So right up there, they have a soil probe and it's hard to see with this light, but you can, there's like little um, black spots on there from the soil. So that would tell you that the soil is sticking to that. It is still wet and it doesn't need to be watered. There's also these things called moisture meters and they'll give you a reading from dry to moist, um, but these can be inconsistent. I've had some before where it's like, I just drenched it with water and then use a moisture meter and it said it was super dry. So it's just kind of hard to go off of those sometimes. So I like using my finger the most. So if the soil is moist and it's cool to the touch, you can just leave your plant alone. It's good to go for a little while. If the soil is dusty and it feels room temperature, then you can give it a drink of that water. In terms of how dry you want your soil to be before you water it again, different plants like to dry out at different levels. But a general rule of thumb is to let the potting mix dry out like a half to a fourth of the way down the planter. You wanna make sure it's um, pretty much dried out. But with things like cacti and succulents, they like to dry out pretty much completely. So you can just let those guys sit there for a while. They really like to dry out. And this is because in general, plants with thicker leaves are better at retaining that water. So they don't have to have that constant water coming for them. But also things like ferns and calatheas, these would much rather be like moist soil. So not soggy or wet all the time, but they'll do better with that moisture soil. So to help you learn when a plant needs water, you can watch the plant for signs of underwatering distress. Mm -hmm. So having like limp, droopy leaves is usually a good sign that it might need some water. So like this guy down here, you'd mm -hmm. still want to test the soil, but it's probably a good bet that he needs some water to mm -hmm. perk him up. So in terms of how to water, the best way to water every plant, even your sacti or your cacti and your succulents, is to water it deeply and fully saturate the soil every time. So the best way is for water to be flowing out of that drainage hole in the bottom of your pot. And we'll talk some more about the importance of drainage. Uh, but you also wanna make sure you're watering all the way around the plant. So not just hitting one spot because then that allows for the whole root ball to get that water. And a root ball is basically just the massive roots. So make sure that all those roots are able to access that water. And in terms of where you water, you can either bring your plants to water or water to your plants. So if the plant is movable, I like to bring mine to the sink and then I can just water them there, let them drain out. I'll just let them sit in the sink for a little bit to get any of the rest of it while I move on to the next plant and just kind of like rotate them out as I go. You can also water in the shower, the tub, even outside if it's nice. Just kind of makes for less mess and, and makes it a little bit easier sometimes. But for plants that aren't movable, then I bring my watering can over to them. So I'll water. And then whenever water is still in the saucer underneath the plant, so coming out of the drainage hole, then I'll stop. And I usually just mop it up with like an old towel. But you can also do something like get a turkey baster and suck the water out. Uh, but the main thing is you just don't want that water to sit there because that can cause some problems in the future. So wrong ways to water would be watering with just a little bit of water because you're not fully saturating the soil. If you're watering too often before the soil has a chance to dry out, because then it's having too much water in there. Um, watering with ice cubes, this is a common suggestion for things like orchids, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the best because it's not fully saturating that soil either. And then that water is really cold for these plants that are pretty much tropical plants. Mm -hmm. So they're not expecting that really cold <laughs> ice water. So that can cause problems too. Or watering in a plant that doesn't have drainage. 
So this allows water to just sit at the bottom of that pot and then cause root rot if it doesn't have anywhere to go out of. There's also bottom watering. So this is just another method of watering your plants. This is when you basically put your plants and inside the pot, all of it into another container. So like this one is in a glass bowl with some water and basically that plant will just suck that water up from beneath. Um, this takes longer to do. It's usually like 20 to 60 minutes until that plant is fully saturated and you'll know when that's happened whenever you can touch the top and the soil is like moist to the touch um, you know then it's gone all the way through but um, I know some people who will just like fill up their bathtub and throw all their plants in there and just passively water them for about an hour and then take them out so it just depends on what's best for you um, one thing with the bottom watering method is that sometimes you want to do the normal top watering method so that you can flush out any buildup of salts and minerals that can get in there and then cause issues too. So even if you do bottom water, it's a good idea. Just do that flush every once in a while. Uh, but that uh, bottom watering can be really good for plants who are picky about water on their leaves. So things like African violets, which get like watermarks if they get water on their leaves, that can be useful to avoid that situation. All right, so overwatering and underwatering. So as long as your plant has drainage, overwatering doesn't have anything to do with the amount of water you use. Um, instead, it's more about watering too frequently before that soil can dry out. And this is why drainage is so important because it's really anyone's guess as to how much water you'll need to fully saturate that plant without leaving a ton in the bottom because in that standing water is where those problems lie with root rot. So in these pictures up here, the one on the left has some like pretty whitish colored roots. They'd be firm to the touch if you um, squeeze them. But then the ones on the right are like darker brown. They'd be mushy and they might even have like a swampy smell to them. And that's a sign that you have some root rot going on so that you have watered it too much too frequently and that um, the roots are struggling because of that. So whereas underwatering, either you are not watering frequently enough and the soil is becoming too dry or you aren't using enough water to fully saturate that soil so it's not getting fully hydrated ever. But um, as long as you have drainage in your planter, you really cannot water it too much at one time. So you could use a watering can, you could use like a five gallon bucket, all of that water that it doesn't need will just drain out the bottom. So it only keeps what it needs in that soil, that pot. All right, so in terms of considerations for water, uh, for water temperature, you want to try to keep it in the like, mid-range temperature, so nothing too hot or too cold, because again, these are mainly tropical plants naturally, so they're not expecting the really hot or really cold water. Um, using tap water is just fine for most plants. There are some who will be picky and won't like the tap water, but for the majority of plants, you should be good with tap water. And there is like a myth that some water has too much chlorine that can cause issues, like browning tips. Usually there isn't enough chlorine in our water to make that effect on houseplants, so you should be pretty good with tap water. In terms of distilled and then softened water, um, distilled usually isn't necessary except for those really picky ones that don't like the tap water. Plus it'd be really expensive to continually water your plants with distilled water over and over. Um, softened water isn't great because it has added salts in it and this over time can dehydrate your plant. But if you have something like a reverse osmosis system that can filter those out, then, then you're good to use that. There's also very much a relationship between light and water. So in general, the more light you have, the more water you'll have, you're, you'll need. And then the less light you have is less water that you'll need just in general. Also, your watering could change with the seasons. So um, in general, like in winter, plants don't need as much water because they aren't pushing out new growth as much. So it's not like they go dormant, but they're definitely not as active and not growing as much as in like spring and summer months. On the other hand, plants may need more water in the summer because they are getting more of that sunlight, if the sun's out longer, and it's a lot stronger. So they may need more water then because they're pushing out that new growth. This is another reason why it's important not to have a watering schedule and instead have that checking schedule because their needs can change just through the months. All right, now we're going to talk about light. So light is super important because it is essential for photosynthesis. So this happens when the chlorophyll, which is in the green part of the plant, absorbs the energy from sunlight. Then plants use this light energy to change water, which they get from the roots, and it's, uh, carbon dioxide from the air, 
into oxygen and nutrients called sugar. And then they use these sugars to grow. So whenever you're thinking about light, there's some different things you should consider. So things like what direction your windows face, um, if anything's blocking that light, and your plant's individual needs. So for types of light, there's lots of different lighting conditions that exist out there. Um, it can take some trial and error to kind of figure out what light you have and what would work best for your plants. But in general, you can break light down into four different categories. So we have direct light. That's exactly how it sounds. The sun is shining on that plant without anything blocking it for at least most of the day. Uh, plants that do really well in this light tend to be those that are more drought tolerant and have thicker leaves. We also have bright indirect light. So this is when the sun isn't directly hitting the plant for at least most of the day, but it may get a couple hours of direct sunlight, like in the afternoon when the sun is passing over there. And this is a really uh, sweet spot for most plants because it keeps them protected from that potential sun scorch, but gives them enough light to be able to grow. There's also medium indirect light. So this is really heavily filtered light or light that's further back from the window. This is really good for plants whose natural environment is under a canopy. So they're used to having that overhang over them and not getting that direct light. There's also low light, which no plant loves, but there are plants that can tolerate it much better than others. Let me mention this picture really quick. So um, that number one in that uh, window is getting that bright direct light. because He's right against the window. He's getting pretty much all of that sunlight throughout the day. Whereas number two, he's a little off to the side of the window and might get those couple hours of that direct sunlight in the afternoon. Then three, that one is much farther back, so it's not getting as much direct light there. And then four is low light, so it's pretty far away from the window and won't be getting much back there. Window direction also plays a role in how much light that you get. So in general, north-facing windows get low to moderate indirect light. So this is good for low-light plants like snake plants, pothos, ZZ plants, things like that. South facing windows will get a lot of that bright indirect light with some direct light in the afternoon as well. This is great for sun loving plants, so things like succulents and ficus. We have east facing windows, so this is generally medium to bright indirect light, depending on the time of day. And these spaces are good for plants that can tolerate kind of a wider spectrum of light, so things like Monstera deliciosa or fiddle leaf figs. And we have west facing windows. So these will give you generally medium to bright indirect light. These are similar to east facing windows, but they'll get some more direct sun in the afternoon as that sun is starting to set. This is also an ideal place for most house plants. So there's a couple visuals up here. You can see with this north facing window, even when that plant is like right up against the window, it's really only gonna get that bright indirect light just because it doesn't get that much sun during the day. And then as you go further back, it goes to medium light and then low light. But if we compare that to a south facing window, so this plant is a little farther back in the front, but it's still getting that direct sunlight. And then as we go further back, it'll get bright indirect and then medium. You can see in this one, low light would be like even more further off to the side. And we have east facing windows. Um, so this will get like some soft morning light. So you still do get that direct light in the front there. And then it, yeah, gets farther back as you go further away from the window. And then west is similar, except it'll get a little bit more of that direct sunlight for a little bit longer as that sun is setting. So is that cactus still getting direct sunlight? And that bird of paradise in the corner is getting that medium light. It's a little more filtered. You also want to think about anything that might be blocking your windows, both inside and outside. So even if you have a south-facing window, if you have maybe another house right next to it or a really big tree out there, that'll affect how much light you're getting. Um, same thing with anything inside, so things like furniture or drapes, things like that, that'll also affect your light. And then the size of your windows. So if you have larger windows, you can get away with putting the plant a little bit further, whereas the smaller windows, it'll need to be closer to get the light that it needs. In terms of knowing what kind of light a plant does need, it'll often be listed on the plant's tag whenever you buy it. You can also look up its requirements online just by searching the name. 
Uh, if you don't know the name of the plant, there are many different kinds of apps that exist where you can just take a picture of the plant and then it'll pop up with the name and some care information, things like that. But in general, if you don't know the light requirements, a safe jumping off point is that bright indirect light. So you can try a location and then look for any changes in growth or differences in coloring. But a good rule or a good rule of thumb is that the thicker the leaves, the more light the plant needs. So like think about the thickness of like cacti or succulent leaves compared to like the leaves of ferns, which are much thinner and more delicate. So those cacti and succulents can handle that sun out in the desert, whereas those ferns will thrive under a canopy of trees. If your plant gets really like gangly and is like reaching towards the light, that's probably a sign that it needs more light. So you want to move it a little closer or switch the window. You can have too much light, but in most homes, it's a much bigger challenge to get enough light. But if you notice that your plant is getting like almost like white or like a light brown on their leaves, that could be a sign that it's getting scorched by the sun and it might need less light. So if your house doesn't have great lighting to keep your plants happy, you can continue consider supplementing with grow lights. So these are artificial lights that help stimulate photosynthesis and encourage growth. They come in a variety of different colors and light intensities, and there's different types. So we have fluorescent, which gives you like a really wide spectrum of light, but can have some harmful heat output that can be bad for your plants. Same with incandescent, like they're pretty cheap, um, but they will use a lot of energy and burn out quicker and also have that harmful heat input. Then we have LED. So these have a longer lifespan and they are more energy efficient and have a lower heat output. So these are a pretty solid choice if you're looking for grow lights. There's also HID lights. These are very expensive. These are what they use in like commercial grow rooms. So usually there's not really a need for uh, people like us to have them just in their homes. Um, but they're so expensive because they replicate that natural light the best. So your lights can range from $20 to 2000 bucks mm -hmm. and they can come as a bulb versus a more industrial style setup. You can see this top one here is more like a bar light, whereas that bottom one is more just like a lamp that you would have and to turn on. But in general, you want to think about like the temperature of the bulb and then how close your plant is to it. So you don't want it too close that it's getting scorched, but also not too far away. So it's not getting the benefits. So that can take some trial and error to figure out what's best for that. But in general, you want to go like six to 24 inches away, depending on that light source. So if it's an LED, you can probably go a little closer, whereas if it's that fluorescent or incandescent, you want to have a little further away to um, protect it from that hot heat from the light. And you just want to use them for about eight to 12 hours a day. So just kind of replicating the natural uh, day and night cycle. All right, so environment, in terms of temperature, your house temperature won't be super important. Um, some plants really like the warmer temperatures and will do well, but basically if you're comfortable, your plants will be too for the most part. One thing that will affect them is if they're placed near things like windows or vents or doors. Um, if they're close to any of these, this really changes their environment. This is because if you have a plant next to a vent, it's getting that like hot, dry air blasted on it. The same thing with having it right next to a really cold window is getting that coldness from, from the glass. So if you have a plant that's struggling, maybe think about where it's located. Could it be getting something blown on it? Um, could it be too close to a window? Same thing if it's maybe getting bumped by people or pets, if it's in a walkway or by a door, that could also cause damage as well. Humidity is also a pretty big factor that can affect plants. So um, most house plants are gonna be native to those tropical environments and they love humidity. There are certain types of plants that really need it to be happy. So things like ferns and calatheas can be pretty picky. But a general rule of thumb is the thinner the leaf, the more humidity a plant requires. And the best way to increase humidity is to use a humidifier. If you don't have a humidifier, you can kind of increase the humidity of your plants by clustering them really close together. That can kind of bump up that humidity. There's also misting plants. So it's a um, myth that misting plants can increase humidity um, because it doesn't do this, at least not long-term. 
So there is a momentary increase in humidity when you actually spray those plants and there's water still on there. But as soon as that water evaporates, it's not getting any of the benefits of that humidity. So if you want to go around just spraying constantly, you could, but that's yeah, not very realistic and not super helpful for your plants. There's also pebble trays. Um, these also aren't as effective as you would hope they are. This is basically what it sounds like, a tray with some pebbles and then some water in it. And the idea is for it to be absorbed upward to the house plant and give it some humidity. But it really just kind of disperses throughout the room. It doesn't really go up to hit that plant as much as it um, should to increase that humidity. So the best way is with that humidifier. 50% is a good goal just for general house humidity for plants. And you can also find out your humidity by getting a little like handheld detector or your humidifier can also detect your humidity as well. All right, so cleaning plants. This is another important aspect of making sure your plant can get as much light as possible. So this is one of those things that like, seems very tedious, but it can make a big difference for your plants. This is because dust and dirt and other debris can build up on your plant leaves over time. And this interferes with your plant's ability to feed itself through photosynthesis. So a way to combat this is by just giving your plants a shower. So just putting them in the shower and giving them a little spray down. Or you can also use a damp cloth to wipe their leaves down. One thing with the cloth is you'll want to make sure that your plants don't have any pests because if you go around wiping all of the plants with the same cloth, that could easily spread some pests. So that's just something to keep in mind. We'll talk some more about pests and all that fun stuff. But there are some plants that have like sticky or fuzzy leaves and they don't like to get their leaves wet. So in this case, you can use something like a mushroom brush. So right down the bottom there, or even just like a dry paint brush, you can just brush off the leaves and that can just kind of give them a little brushing up. There's not really a set rule about how often to clean off your plants. Um, if you notice dust, it's a good idea to clean them off. I like to go around to all of them in the springtime and just wipe them all down to give them kind of a little boost for the growing season. Um, some people use things like mayonnaise or milk or vegetable oil to clean or shine their plants' leaves. And it's just not a good idea. <laughs> it's, it can have like, cause the stomata to be clogged, which are kind of like the pores of our skin. So it's just slathering that surface with those materials and it's just not great for the plant or for it to be able to photosynthesize. All right, so potting. So planters is another word for pots. So you might hear those used interchangeably. And there are so many different types of planters made from different materials. So common ones are things like um, plastic, terracotta, ceramic, all different types and different shapes. You can find most of these at most garden centers and a wide variety of different pots. And the most standard size is what they, sorry, the most common size is what they call a standard size pot. So this means that the diameter in the opening is the same as the height of the pot. But in general, you want to choose a planter that is a few inches wider than your plant's root ball. So you can see in this picture, there's like a couple of inches all the way around that plant to give a little space to grow. Um, there's a myth that if you plant in a larger pot, it'll make your plant grow bigger and faster. And that's not the case because it can get overwhelmed by all that soil and all the water that gets in there and it just can't use all that up. So then it makes it harder on the plant. The most important thing about any planter is that it has drainage. So drainage is so important because of being able to saturate that soil fully without either compensating by underwatering or then overwatering it. If you don't have drainage, it also eliminates the option of soil flushing. So getting out the salt built up, minerals, things like that. And this can lead your plant to become dehydrated even if you're watering them all the time. Most plants that have drainage holes will have a saucer that comes with them. So this saucer will sit underneath the pot, so it'll catch that water that comes out and won't damage any surface that it's sitting on, things like that. But you never wanna let that water sit in the saucer. This can cause root rot and just cause like mold issues in the saucer itself. If you do have a container that doesn't have a drainage hole, it can be used as like a decorative container to put a different pot in. So you basically have that pot within a pot. And then whenever you want to water that plant, you can take that pot out, give it a water, let it drain, and then put it back in that nice pot that looks prettier. So that's a way to get around it. And you can also drill a hole. I've done that just to add some and then put a drainage tray underneath it. 
that makes it easier for you. So potting supplies, in general, you'll need um, your pot, uh, soil scoop. I literally just use an old cup that I got from a restaurant like 10 years ago. It doesn't have to be fancy at all. Um, potting soil, and we'll talk about different kinds in a second. Water, uh, newspapers or plastic is a good idea to cover the surface where you're working. So like I use our kitchen table, so then it's easy to just roll everything up and toss that and have less of a cleanup afterwards. Um, gloves can be helpful if you want to keep your hands clean. It can help with any allergies you may have to anything in the soil. Um, stakes and ties can also be helpful. So this is usually for plants that are kind of top heavy or need some more support. Um, those could come in handy to kind of give your plants a little boost. Some people like to put mesh in the bottom of their planters. This can be helpful if you have like a really large drainage hole and soil comes out of it like all the time sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. I usually don't put mesh in because then this prevents the roots from growing out of the hole, which can give you a sign when it's time to repot. Mm -hmm. So I like having that option of having that indicator. Uh, but some people like the mesh, so it's really up to you. So for potting mix, this is uh, the same as soil or medium, so you may hear those words as well. Basically, the soil is just going to anchor those roots in the container. It will supply water and nutrients to the plant, and then it provides that aeration. So there are many different types of mixes out there, and some are specific to certain plant species. But in general, just like an all-purpose mix usually works well for most houseplants. Um, some will be a little bit pickier or will thrive in different types of soil. So they make soil for things like cacti, succulents, and African violets. Uh, the cacti soil will have more sand in it for the quicker drainage, whereas like African violet soil usually has um, some extra like peat moss and perlite for some added drainage. But just in general, having that like chunky potting mix with different sized particles is your best way to go. Because these particles will create small air pockets that allow air and water to flow through. And this can help prevent root rot and overwatering if you have that plant that has drainage as well. So here are a couple brands. Um, my favorite is that Fox Farm one. You can get that at pretty much any like big box store, like Home Depot, Lowe's. Uh, I've seen some of these at places like Walmart. So lots of different options there. Uh, a potting myth. So some people like to put rocks in the bottom of their planter because they think it will help with drainage. They think it gives it that extra layer to let water to go into. Uh, but it actually creates two issues. So one is that it creates that opportunity for that like swampy area to form. So it like holds that water and it can't all drain out. So then that can cause problems in the future because those plant roots can't reach down to absorb it and get it out of there. It also creates a perched water table, which is the fancy way of saying that it's tough for liquid to move from a fine material like the potting mix to a coarser material like that drainage layer because of the difference in available airspace. So this ends up keeping the water with the roots instead of going down into the rocks like you would want it to. So like in that top picture, you can see there's kind of like a wet layer down there where there's lower roots are in because uh, it can't get into all those rocks. Whereas down here, that lower layer uh, or that loyal soil is much lower and the roots aren't getting trapped in that. And using soil all the way through also gives your roots some more room to grow. So a little bonus there as well. Okay, so fertilizing. Fertilizing is a way to introduce some more nutrients to your plants. There's generally like three main components to each fertilizer, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, plus some other micronutrients and things like that. And these can be found in the different types of materials. So things like potting mix or additives, and this is, can be helpful because plants that are grown outside get their nutrients from the soil. And the same thing happens for our plants, but they have a much smaller space to work with because they're trapped in that pot. So because they're in that contained environment, they can use up that, those nutrients that are in the soil a lot faster and they don't have that full range that's available to them. So this is why fertilizer can help. Um, there's different types. So there's liquid fertilizer where you add it to a watering can based on how much water you have in that can. Um, I use that one that's right up there. It's by a brand called Happy Happy Houseplant. So I'll just add like a little tiny drop into my water and then I can just go around and my plants do great on it. And it works, works really well for me. 
There's also this like water soluble type. So that kind of like blue crystal things down there, they'll be measured into the watering can and then absorbed that way. There's also slow release. So these are like the little balls that you might see in some of the houseplant, um, like just soil and things like that. Um, this is really good for outdoor plants, but not as great for indoor plants because they're continually going to be breaking down and releasing fertilizer all the time. And your plants don't necessarily need fertilizer in the winter since they're not pushing out as much growth. Um, usually people will just fertilize in like the spring and summer, things like that. So sometimes that um, fertilizing can kind of over fertilize in those little ball forms that come in the soil. The frequency definitely depends on the type of fertilizer you're using. So some, like I use that every time that I water for the most part, except in like really deep winter. Um, others you only use periodically throughout the growing season. So it just kind of depends on what you're using. So fertilizing definitely isn't necessary, but it can help plants thrive. All right, repotting. So eventually your plant will need to be repotted. You may do this because you want to transfer it from its original grow pot so that you get it in whenever you buy it to a sturdier, like more appealing pot. Um, the plant may also outgrow its pot. So the roots can become crowded with nowhere to go, which makes the plant root bound. And if you don't repot the plant, then the roots will eventually basically stop the soil from absorbing that water. So you may feel like you're watering it all the time and it, the plant still isn't doing well. It may have also used up all the available nutrients from the soil. So they only have that limited number available. And then salt buildup can also be a problem. So it makes it harder for the plant to take up water. Like this plant at the top there, it's very root bound. There's <laughs> very little soil for that plant. And then it's hard to see this one at the bottom has kind of like a white rim. And that's that salt buildup that's going to dehydrate that plant over time. Mm -hmm. So in terms of when to repot, um, usually plants are pretty good at giving you some indicators of when they're ready. So one is that the roots have just overtaken that soil and are just a really tight, compacted mass. So that top guy is just like all roots and needs a bigger place to go to expand. Another way you can tell is if the roots are growing out of the drainage holes in the planter. So they're just trying to find anywhere to go. So that one at the bottom, those little roots are poking out down there and you could use a bigger pot to go into. If your plant needs to be watered more frequently than it should, if you feel like you're just watering it constantly and nothing's happened, that could be a sign that it needs to be uh, repotted. Or if even with watering, the plant constantly looks like it's underwatered. So having those like droopy, dull leaves that might be yellowing, that could also be a sign that it needs um, a new pot. Or if your new growths aren't doing well, that can also indicate let's see, oh, if your pot has any cracks in it or that it's salt residue buildup. Or if the water sits on top of the soil and takes a really long time to drain, that could be that the soil has gotten compacted over time and there's not enough airspace for that water to go through. Or the opposite, if the water drains too quickly, then that could be because the soil is kind of shrinking away from the sides and the water is just running through those sides instead of getting into the soil. So it can be kind of, kind of anything. <laughs> but the good rule of thumb is to repot about once a year. Uh, the best time to do this is during the growing season, the beginning of it in like March or April, so around this time. And this is because root damage inevitably occurs whenever you're repotting. So um, repotting during its growth period can encourage those roots to bounce back and then push out new growth. Um, this doesn't mean you can't repot in winter, especially if your plant is suffering. Um, and if you think it needs to be repotted, it's usually better to repot it you know, in December than try to make it wait until March to, to pull through. So in terms of where to repot, you'll want to generally choose one pot size up. And so all planters are categorized based on the diameter of the opening, and they're sized in two inch increments. So you'll generally want to go up two inches, so like four inches to six or 10 to 12. As you can see, this top picture up here, that plant is being moved from that pot on the left, the one on the right. It's a little bit of a bigger opening and it's a little bit taller to give it that room to expand further. You want to stick to a pot that is just a few inches wider than that root ball still. And that's because moving it to that too large of a pot can cause those problems. So having too much soil, too much water, things like that. But also if the plant is healthy and you don't want it to get any bigger, you don't have to necessarily move it to a larger pot. 
you can basically just refresh the soil. So take out that old soil, put in new soil, um, and just kind of give it that new stuff to work with. So yeah, if you don't want it to get bigger and it's doing fine, that's that's totally fine to do. So in terms of how to repot, uh, you'll start by just taking the plant out of the pot. And so how this happens depends on what kind of pot you have. So if it's like a pliable, like soft plastic pot, you can kind of squeeze it to loosen up that root ball. If it's a rigid pot, I like to dump out some of the soil on top just to kind of make it a little cleaner and then tilt the pot and try to slide the plant out. Um, if it doesn't come out, you can kind of wiggle it or pull on it. You can also run a knife around the edge to try to loosen up any roots that might be sticking onto the sides. Um, last resort is to cut or break the pot. If it comes to it, you can go that route. Uh, once it's removed, you'll want to tease that root ball apart with your fingers a little bit. So especially if it's really entangled or densely packed, because your goal is to have a massive roots that's ready to spread and go outwards. The roots should be like pretty nice and light, like a whitish color, and they should be firm. If you notice any that are like brown or mushy, you can just cut those off because they won't be doing the plant any good. You can just get rid of those. And then at this point, you'll add soil to the new pot and then test out the height of the plant in there. You may need to add soil or take some out, but basically you want the soil to go up to the, like the base of the stem of the plant so that all the roots are covered, but so you're not engulfing too much of the stem in that soil. And then you'll also want to have the soil level end a couple inches below the top of your planter. That just helps with making sure like soil and water doesn't overflow whenever you're watering. So just having a little wiggle room at the top. And then you'll want to kind of gently press down your soil. So you don't want it to be super compact, but also not super loose. So just like a nice little pat to make sure it's in there. And then you'll want to water the plant right after you repot it. This method is useful for small, more manageable plants, whereas large plants can become almost impossible to repot. So in this case, you can enlist someone to help you repot it. So kind of holding the plants, you pull the pot off best you can do, um, or you can just do your best to swap out most of that soil to at least give it some fresh soil to be in. All right, propagation. So this is a way to basically multiply your house plants by creating new plants from existing plants. Um, this is also a good way to share plants with others. You can propagate almost any plant using different methods. So the main methods are rooting a cutting, rooting a leaf, and dividing. We're just going to talk about rooting a cutting today just for sake of time. But in general, you'll just need a plant and then some scissors or pruners and then a just some sort of vessel, either with water or soil, depending on what route you decide to go. So when you're rooting a cutting, this can be done in water or soil. Um, water is especially cool because then you can see the roots growing, which is always neat. Uh, but you'll want to basically start by cutting like a half inch to an inch below where the leaf meets the stem of a plant. This is called a node. It's kind of like a little bump on the side of a plant. And you'll also want to remove any leaves that are like lower down that would be caught in the soil or the water just because that won't do them any good. So like in this picture up here, they have um, that bottom snip is where you would cut that off in between those nodes. And then that snip that's higher up would be cutting off that leaf so that it's not stuck in that soil or that water. So whenever you um, have your propagation cut, if you're using the water method, you'll put it in fresh water in any container. It can be like a propagation tube, like they have up there, or it could just be something like a drinking glass. Definitely doesn't have to be fancy. Um, and you just wanna change out the water like weekly or whenever you notice it getting kind of dirty. And then once the roots are a couple inches long, your cutting is ready to be removed from the water and put into soil. Uh, this could vary from a couple weeks to over a month, depending on the type of plant. Uh, but you don't want to leave it in water for too long because it can make the shift to soil more difficult. So once it's those few inches, it's usually good to move it. If you're using the soil method, you want to insert most of the plants, um, at least two thirds into that soil, and then keep it pretty moist and in that indirect light so it can start to root and take form in that pot. Some easy plants to propagate are things like pothos, aglionema, diffenbachia, philodendron, and dracaena. Now we have pests. <laughs> so these are a very annoying and sadly almost unavoidable part of plant parenthood. 
So many pests will feed on houseplants and they can eventually kill your plants if you don't get rid of them. In terms of why pests happen, um, usually it's on a new plant that's brought into your house that had pests on it that then spread to other plants. But uh, they can also just literally hitch a ride on you after you've been outside. They can come in from open windows. They can also be in bags of soil. But one thing to note is that unhealthy plants are more susceptible to pests. It's um, easier for pests to cling on to those and get what they need from them. And it's also much easier to prevent pests than to treat them. So they can be very difficult to eradicate and take a lot of time to do. So let's see. In order to prevent pests, you want to examine any potential purchases really thoroughly. So check in underneath the leaves um, where the leaf meets the stem. Those are some common hiding places for pests. It's also a good idea to separate new plants from other plants whenever you get them home. So just having them even just a couple feet or just not right up against another plant can be really helpful. Um, also, if you move your plants outside for the summer, that's a really easy way for pests to hop onto your plants. So check in the leaves and the soil and all that stuff before you bring it back in. And in general, it's a good idea to just kind of check in on your plants every time you're watering them, because it's much easier to take care of a couple than like a full-on infestation of pests. So just taking a quick peek at the leaves and the stem can save a lot of time and effort in the future. Uh, there's also neem oil. So this is a natural solution for managing pests that acts as a repellent. So there's different um, types. So some will just be ready to go in whatever product they're in. Some you mix with like water or some like soap, things like that. Um, but basically you'll just wanna spray your plants all over, um, including the undersides of leaves. And you can apply it on a regular basis, like every few months or so to just kind of keep your pests at bay. Um, one thing with neem oil is that it does temporarily make your leaves more susceptible to burning. So it's a good idea to do it in the evening to let it you know, dry and do its thing so it's not in that sunlight. Okay, so treating pests. There are different treatment methods depending on the type of pest. So general rule of thumb is to separate that infested plant. So find a little spot to kind of quarantine it. Um, they sell these little like mini greenhouses all on Amazon, which is ever fun. So just a little way to separate your plant from the other ones while you're taking care of it. Um, you'll always want to wash your hands and any supplies before and after you're dealing with pests to help prevent any further spreading. So I'm going to give you like a quick overview of different treatment methods, and then we're going to look at, I think, six specific pests and how to treat them. So one method is to spray with water. Um, so just that's exactly what it sounds, spraying a plant with water um, will remove many pests. It's um, a good idea to maybe do this in the shower so you can really spray all the surfaces, things like that. This is especially good for spider mites, which can be very annoying to get rid of. Um, isopropyl alcohol. So you can use a cotton swab dipped in alcohol to wipe off certain insects. There's also insecticidal soaps. So spraying the plant with this soap can often eliminate a pest infestation if you do it multiple times. This is a contact insecticide, so that means it only works when it hits those pests directly. So once it dries, it won't have any effect on them. This is helpful for what they call soft-bodied pests. So many of the things we're gonna look at, things like aphids and mealybugs, things like that. But since pests may be hidden or in the egg stage, this is why it takes multiple rounds usually to get rid of them. And you'll likely have to um, use these products like every week or so, depending on the instructions until the pests are gone. If, the, um, if these methods don't work, you may want to turn to a stronger chemical pesticide, but it's usually best to try these like gentler means of control first. Um, you can also use neem oil afterwards, so this can help to prevent future pests. It doesn't kill on contact like the insecticidal soap does, but it can kind of help to smother remaining pests, so it can still help you out a little bit. But sometimes it's just best to get rid of the plant completely, <laughs> so it's not worth the effort or the time or it's spreading to other plants. And that's totally fine. All right, so mealybugs. These guys are small and covered with this like cotton-like white fluff. They move around really slowly and they're often found where the leaf attaches to the stem and the undersides of leaves. And so these guys suck plant sap. That's how it damages the plant. 
So if you have these guys, you might see some like sticky honeydew on your leaves. And this is actually material that is excreted from the pests. So if you see like any dew on there, it could be a sign you have some pests. Um, things like yellow leaves and stunted growth. To treat these guys, the best way is to remove them with that cotton swab dipped in the isopropyl alcohol. The alcohol kills them instantly, and then it makes it easy to just like pick them off and get rid of them. Um, you can also use that insecticidal soap and then neem oil afterwards. We have spider mites. These guys are so, so tiny. <laughs> like even this top picture, that's his, you know, fingernail magnified and he still is so, so small. <laughs> So these guys are more closely related to spiders than insects, and they also suck that plant sap. So you'll also see that honeydew. You may also see like fine webbing on leaves. And usually you'll see this webbing first before you see these little guys just because they're so small. So uh, water is really effective against spider mites. So just spraying your plant down with water can help. That insecticidal soap and then that neem oil can also help. One thing with them is that chemical insecticides usually don't work very well. It's just a heads up for those. And we have aphids. So these are small, kind of like pear-shaped insects. And they are usually green, but they can be other colors as well. The adults may have wings and can also carry viruses. And they're usually found feeding on new growth or the undersides of leaves. Some will feed on the roots, but in general, they'll suck plant sap as well. So you'll see that honeydew as well as leaves yellowing or like curling under. And then that stunted growth or like deformed buds like to hang out on that new growth. So these guys, water also works well against them. You can also remove them with that cotton swab and alcohol, soap, and then the neem oil as well. <laughs> Scale. So this, these guys are so strange. <laughs> these are these little round, round bumps that are usually have like a hard exterior and the adults don't move. So they can almost look like part of the plant. They'll just be stuck on there. And they have, their like babies are called crawlers and they move around until they find a place to hang out. But they're so small, we can't even see them with the naked eye. So you'll only see these adult guys. And they're usually found on stems and on their side of leaves. So they'll also have that sticky honeydew and then yellowy patchy leaves. These guys can be removed with a cotton swab with alcohol. Sometimes you have to like use your fingernail to scrape them off and it's very unpleasant. <laughs> but also that insecticidal soap and then neem oil as well. And then fungus gnats. So these are small little gnats that will usually be seen um, in the houseplant soil or just flying around in your house. Um, the adults don't feed on the plants, but they're very annoying <laughs> to people. And the larvae will feed on the soil matter and the roots, which is what causes the damage to the plants. So for these guys, for the adults at least, you can place sticky traps near the plant or around your house. Um, but to get rid of them totally, you will need to get rid of those babies. So the best way is to use a product that contains BTI which is something you basically put into the soil and then it'll kill all those larvae that are living down there and at least stop the, stop the cycle. You can also try to let the plant dry out as much as possible to kill the larva and letting water, uh, like taking water out from that saucer can help, but I've only found luck with the BTI drops to really get rid of them. Because it says BTI drops. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, if you search for something like BTI drops yeah. or solution, okay. yeah, it'll it'll pop up for you. <laughs> yeah, they're terrible. <laughs> okay, so general troubleshooting. If your plant is having a tough time, so this can include things like yellowing leaves, if the leaves are curling or wilting, um, brown tips, if leaves are dropping, pretty much anything that's going on. First, you want to check the soil. So most plants will die because they're under or over watered. So if it's wet, let it dry out. If it's dry, give it a drink. Step two, if you're confident that you're watering well, then take a look at the light. Um, try moving it to a place with more light. It's usually the case that it needs more light. Uh, step three, if it's not water or lighting related, then check the environment. So like what's happening around the plant? Is it by um, events? Could it need to be repotted? Things like that. I'm sorry, let's see, that's number four. Repotting is number four. 
So could it be root bound or have um, like used up all the ingredients in the soil, things along those lines. And then step five is to check for pests. So one thing to remember is that once a leaf starts dying, there's no bringing it back. Mm -hmm. So if you're experimenting with what might be the problem, don't look to those leaves that are like suffering, look toward new growth and see what the plant is doing elsewhere because you're not gonna get that leaf back. Um, yellow leaves in general, they can be either a problem or just be a normal part of a plant's life. So as plants mature, it's normal for older leaves to turn yellow and then die off. So you can remove these yellow leaves or you can just wait for them to kind of fall off naturally. If you leave them, you can use them to kind of look for patterns. So like one yellow leaf isn't a big deal, but if you have a bunch in a short period of time, it usually means there's a problem. So like this guy up here, he has a leaf that's starting to turn yellow at the bottom there. Since at the bottom, it's probably an older leaf that's been there for a while and it's probably just dying off on its own. Probably isn't a problem. This one has a lot more yellow leaves. It has some brown tips, it's really droopy. So he probably has something going on that needs to be addressed. Uh, but another thing to note is that plants don't put any effort into um, like these dying leaves because they don't heal themselves like we do. So they aren't, it's not doing any harm to your plant or consuming any of its energy to have those yellow leaves on there. So for buying plants, where to buy them? You can buy them from any big box stores, so like Lowe's, Home Depot. There's also local nurseries and garden stores that are always great. You can also buy plants online. I've had a really good luck with Plant Proper. They give um, really nice big plants for a really affordable price. Um, anything with online shopping though, just like check the reviews, see what people say. Um, it's usually a good indicator if they know what they're doing with their plants or not. So whenever you're selecting a plant, you want to try to consider if you have the right place for it to grow in instead of just based off of looks. Mm -hmm. So they certainly can serve as decor, but they're also living things. So I've definitely bought too many plants that I did not have the adequate resources to take care of just because they looked cool. Uh, but things to look for whenever you're purchasing plants, you want to look for new growth, some firm stems, branches, vines, whatever it's got going on. If you can see the roots, um, they want to be light colored, Vibrant leaves are great. You want to avoid anything that has visible pests on their leaves or their stems, any like droopy leaves or stems. Um, if you can see the roots, if they're like mushy or brown, they're probably rotting. Lots of yellow or brown leaves or spots, probably not a good move. So like that guy at the top there looks great. Would definitely buy that. This one down here, a little droopy, has some brown spots. I'd probably pick out a different one unless I wanted to go on a rescue mission. <laughs> so. <laughs> Whenever you're bringing your plants home, it's usually good to go directly home after buying that plant, especially if it's really hot or cold out because that weather can affect the plants. Um, it's a good idea to isolate that plant for a couple of weeks to prevent those pests from spreading. It'll most likely be in one of those like plastic grow pots whenever you buy it. And it's generally a good idea to give it a few weeks to acclimate to its new environment before you repot it. So just giving it some time to get used to its um, new home can help for you to disturb the root system, things like that. Also important to keep in mind that many houseplants are harmful or even toxic to pets. So they can affect your animal to different degrees if it's ingested, so things like an upset stomach or even death. So it's um, important to recognize which plants are toxic and either keep them away from your, your animals or just not have them in your house at all. So there's lots of common ones like pothos and philodendron, um, snake plants, some pretty easy ones that can be toxic to animals. So just something to keep in mind. Will you include a list of that when you send us this? I can, yeah, that definitely. That would be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, dogs and cats. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Sounds good. All right, so these are some good plants for beginners. So these plants aren't too picky about their care and their environment. Um, they don't require as much looking after, so it's less time and effort in general. So we have like a snake plant. Um, these are great at just being ignored. So their most common reason for dying is being overwatered. So you can just kind of let these guys sit there. And they're usually fine for the most part. Like I water mine, I think once a month maybe. Um, so that one just kind of gets to hang out. Um, pothos, I swear this could like grow under my bed. It is so <laughs> easy to take care of. 
And the good thing with this guy is that it lets you know it needs water because it gets really droopy. So you can tell whenever it needs a drink and then it pops right back up afterwards. Um, spider plants are really cool. They can tolerate low light, um, which is nice. And they are safer pets. So that's a good one as well. Um, philodendron, these guys are really nice because they have these like heart-shaped leaves and they can either climb or trail. So different options there. Uh, Dracaena, lots of different varieties. They can kind of brighten up a room. They have like some really bright lime colored ones. Um, ZZ plants, these are very hardy, very good at being neglected. Um, they are really drought tolerant because they have these like bulb like rhizomes, which can help store some of that water. So they're also really nice to just ignore. Um, Aglionema, they're pretty sturdy and tolerable, lots of different varieties. And then mini monsteras, these are super fast growers. They can tolerate a wide range of light and they're, they're a good bet too. So key takeaways, ensure plants have access to light. Don't water on that set schedule. Um, using planters with drainage holes is key. You want to water your plants really deeply each time and then just check in on your plants. So check the soil, check for new growth, um, any signs of pests, when to repot. And you want to start with more tolerant and easy to care for plants. There are certainly some that are much harder to take care of and much pickier than others. And just know that killing them is part of learning how to take care of them. So <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> We have plenty of books in our collection about taking care of plants. Um, so if you go to our catalog and you type in like house plants, you'll get all of these books and many more. We also have some really cool databases that can help you learn more about plants. So you can access any of these for free with your library card. We have Explora, which is perfect for just like general research that isn't too like scholarly or academic. We have Creative Bug, which has just hours and hours of video classes on different topics. So. One of them is caring for house plants, along with things like sewing, knitting, and other fun stuff. And then Oxford Reference Online give you information about different house plants and their description. So here's how you can contact the reference department. You can call us, um, email us, chat us. We also have what we call book a librarian appointments. So these are one-on-one -on -one meetings with one of our librarians to talk about how to use our databases or to deep dive into any topic you're interested in. And yeah, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a, I have what is called, known as an Easter cactus. Oh. And, and, and it, it had beautiful blossoms yeah. when I bought it. And it hasn't died. I mean, I've had it for three years. It has not bloomed again. It doesn't, okay. it doesn't grow very fast. Yeah. I, I don't know what I can do to make it thrive. Those guys will probably like as much light as you can possibly give it. So if you have a brighter window, that could help. Well, um, I have a north facing. It does get oh, some sun yeah, in the morning. It's yeah. Northeast. It's northeast. Gotcha. Yeah, that could be why. Um, you could also try doing some fertilizer that can help promote flowering and growth. Okay. That might help it out too. But... Is there a particular kind of soil that it needs? or? Those guys aren't too pink, as far as I know. I have mine in just regular, regular soil. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I mean, mine only blooms like once a year. It's definitely not yeah, very common. Yeah, hasn't bloomed at all. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just sort of hanging in there. Yeah. It doesn't look deep green, but I think they, they, I think they are actually not that deep green. So yeah, yeah. So they, you know, they're more yellowish green. Yeah. But so, okay, all yeah. right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you know anything about some of those plant apps, apps that they advertise, like Plant Doctor? Is it worth to spend money on that, or is that nonsense? I would say no, just because you can get it for books, right? Right, and so many things. It could be so many different things. So yeah, if you have like brown tips, it could be related to the humidity. It could be the soil needs to be changed, and like an app won't really be able to tell you that. Yeah. So it sounds really nice and helpful, but yeah, well, they, yeah. they have the, you know, they show a picture of a plant and say it needs this, mm -hmm. you know, like I, I actually tried adding a little coffee to water for a okay. cactus and it did bloom. Oh, interesting. <laughs> okay. There you go. I don't know. <laughs> that works. I don't know why a cactus would want coffee. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> I don't know about coffee. <laughs> it's interesting. 
things that you might compost thing. Yeah, yeah, same kind of idea. And then copy the ones you do. <laughs> Any other questions I can answer? Anything in the chat, Megan? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Can you factor in, for example, this kind of life being very close to your planet in terms of how much light you can get? If you don't have that much money, really. yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you'd want to get like some grow lights. Yeah. That would definitely be your best option. So you can get them on like Amazon. I mean, anywhere. Um, but depending on the type, then you'll want to figure out how close it should be, right? So it's a lot of like mine is a lot of trial and error. So it'd be like, oh, that's too close because that mm -hmm. leaf is being scorched, and then like move it back. So there's not a lot of like straightforward yeah. answers, unfortunately. A lot of it is just messing messing around and trying different things. But yeah, grow lights can definitely be helpful if you don't have like good adequate light. Yeah. Um, Diane and Lucette asked, does it affect plants? If I've lowered the temperature, my house when I'm on vacation, my flooring all the way to sixty. 60 is fine yeah if it gets like too too low i mean like i know i read somewhere that it's like in the 40s that's when the plant starts to be like nope i can't do this for extended periods of time so yeah that's what that should be fine all right so thank you guys so much really appreciate your time and then yeah i have that sign up sheet back there <laughs>